All right, turn your Bibles to the book of Luke. Turn to Luke. Chapter 15. We're going to read a very familiar passage of Scripture today. A very familiar story. Probably a story that everyone here has heard at least once in their life. Before I do that, though, I'm not returning there. Let me say this. It's good to be home. Amen. 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 I have been on the adventure of adventures, crisscrossing the great U.S. from one coast all the way to beyond the other coast. Uh, and I, uh, I, I count, I was actually figuring out the way here, I was gone 26 of 31 days in May. Awesome. Craziness, crazy, crazy. I'm a little under the weather today, and finally all the travel finally caught up with me, and uh, I am just, um, what, yeah, six time zones, so I'm a little bit, you know, all stuffy and hazy and that kind of stuff, so if I seem a little off my game, probably a little off my game. Uh, so just give me some give me some grace today. But I, I've had an amazing month. I started off uh, going back east and spending time with uh, my son for his graduation. Uh, he, he's broadcasting now for the Pennsylvania Rebellion. You can hear him yeah. online. Uh, he did great. Uh, and then got back, spent a couple of days uh, here in Tucson, and almost immediately left for Hawaii, yeah. where I was suffering for Jesus all last week. Um, <laughs> At a, at a teen a teen challenge conference, so I was doing spiritual stuff. Um, rest, it was rough, but somebody had to do it. Uh, we, we had a great great time in Hawaii at the teen challenge conference, and um, we got on a plane Friday night. Uh, it was about ten o'clock Hawaii time, so it was in the morning sometime, about one o'clock in the morning here. When I got on the plane, sat down, um, I was just so excited to be going home. <laughs> as great as Hawaii was, there's this overwhelming feeling of, of peace and comfort knowing that this was the, the journey home. It was the last leg of the trip. I didn't have any more journeys to take. I was headed home. And, and I just had a great feeling. We landed in Phoenix, got in the car to head from Phoenix to Tucson. It's like we couldn't get here fast enough to get home. It was just, man, get me home. We got home and I think immediately hit our own bed. It was like, wow. Yes, get in our own bed, get to watch my own TV, praise the Lord. Uh, don't have to live out of a suitcase anymore. Uh, and what's that? Got to see our dog. Yeah. Um, and, uh, anyway, um, but there's just something about being home. There's something about being able to keep your shoes off and knowing you are in the place that you call home. And all that got me thinking that, you know what, all of us really are on a journey home. Spiritually speaking, physically speaking, of course, spiritually speaking, all of us are on a journey home to our Father God. We're going to talk a lot about that today. But, but even beyond just the spiritual, um, in all areas of our life, think about it, when, when you've in your career, if you get a job and it feels like home, man, it makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? When you just feel like you fit in, you feel like it's your it's your place. Or in a church, when you finally find a church that um, is home, it's your community of faith, and it feels like home. It feels like you can just come in and kick your shoes off, and just don't kick your shoes off right now, please. Um, it just feels like home. There's something about that that feeling, and, and that can be in any area of your life, your finances. Um, your, your relationships, all of us are on a journey home in some area of our life. And nowhere in the scriptures do I think it does it speak to that more clearly than here in Luke chapter 15. I'm going to start reading in verse 11. Uh, I'm reading out of the New King James Version. And we're going to read this entire parable. So stick with me. It's a little bit long, 20 verses, but we can do that, right? Yeah. Jake can, but yeah. the rest of you will just have to come along for the ride. All right. Starting in verse 11, it says, Then he, Jesus, said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And so he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land. And he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would 
gladly have filled his stomach with pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. And when he, came to, when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his servant, to, to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now the older son was in the field. As he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry, would not go in. And therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet... You never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as the son of yours came, who has delivered your livelihood, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you kill the fat calf for him. He said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead, is alive again, and was lost, but now is found. That is Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that you would illuminate your word. I thank you for this ancient story, this ancient parable. Father, I pray it would come alive today. Give us new and fresh revelation. Father, I pray you quicken my body and my voice, Lord. Help me just to, uh, to, to be able to deliver your word today. I thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 A father, after reading the story of the prodigal son to his four-year-old daughter, when he finished, he uh, he asked his daughter what she uh, what, what she was taught by the story. After thinking for a moment, the little girl looked at her father and said, "Never leave home without your credit card." Because, uh, you're, you're slow, but you're working. Um, I don't know if that's really the point of the story. Probably not. Um, but here we have the story of the prodigal. Prodigal Son. It's a, it's a story that all of us have heard. Um, even if you didn't grow up in church, you've heard that story, the story of the Prodigal Son. It's a story that, that transcends even the Bible. It transcends religion. It transcends church. People around the world know this story. And, and I think we're, we're drawn naturally to this, this son, um, this, this boy who... who gets this inheritance, he gets this money, and he, he leaves his father, and he goes and starts doing stupid stuff, basically lives a life of, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and wastes all the money, uh, ends up at the bottom, in basically the, the rock bottom, and then comes to his senses and heads back home, and his father welcomes him back. Um, I think all of us have heard that story, or can relate to that story, and, and we label this boy the prodigal. He's the prodigal son. If you look at the word prodigal, look it up in a thesaurus, you'll find synonyms like excessive, extravagant, immoderate, wasteful, a spendthrift, a squanderer, a wastrel. I like that one the best. A wastrel, that's the word of the day. I didn't know what it meant, so I go to the dictionary. And to my surprise, it means one who wastes. <laughs> it's still a cool word. Um, the word prodigal can be used to describe the actions of a person as it relates to themselves, or it can be used to describe the actions of a person in relation to someone else. And, and I think that applies to this. So I think naturally we would gravitate toward that. Um, but that word prodigal actually is never used in the scripture, the original text. Some of our translations use it, but it's a translated word. It's not actually in the original text. And so my... My premise here today is that 
we have assigned that term prodigal to the wrong character in the story. We have assigned it to the wrong character. I think the term prodigal better describes the father than it does the son. This father who not only lavishly, excessively, and extravagantly gives this boy his inheritance, but even more so, he excessively, lavishly, immoderately, almost wastefully <coughs> welcomes this boy home. And, and, and here's what I, what I want you to, to get right at the beginning. This really is the picture of God the Father. Um, Jesus here, as he tells this story, um, he didn't intend this story to be about the Son. He intended this story to be about the Father. If, if you read the story in its entirety and go back and read it, it in context, you find out Jesus is talking about the Father. At the beginning of the chapter, he talks about a, a shepherd who goes out to find a lost sheep. And then he talks about a woman who loses some money. And, and she goes to find a lost coin. And then he talks about this, this father who loses his son only to gain him back. The story is about the father and how he welcomes this boy home. Lavishly, extravagantly. Wastefully welcomes him home. This boy who messed everything up. This, this kid who, who took his inheritance and went and messed it up, brought pain to the family, brought, brought disgrace to the family name, caused pain for him and his, and his brother. But nonetheless, the father welcomes him home as a prodigal father would. The name of the sermon today is, is the prodigal father. And, and I believe this is a, a picture of of God's character. Jesus here is giving us this beautiful picture of God's character. You know, we have a messed up view of God's character, don't we? Yeah. Why, why is that? Because there are people in our life who are in God roles in our lives. Fathers, mothers, uh, teachers, uh, bosses, and, and those people, those human beings mess up. And then we project their frailty onto God. And we begin to think that if those people, their character is like that, then God's character must be like that. And that's not true. Here, Jesus is giving us this great picture of what God's character is really like. And how he views us when we venture far from home. How he views us when we venture far from him. And if you look closely at the story, you'll see yourself. Some way, somehow, you'll see your, your, yourself. Many times we apply this, this story of the prodigal son to the most extreme cases. Like, you know, we'll, we'll know somebody who's maybe a drug addict, maybe they've totally fallen off the deep end, and that's when we apply this story. But this story applies to so many areas of our life. You may be far from home in your finances. You may have gone far from home uh, maybe in your marriage. Maybe there are areas of your life that you have totally excluded God from. You know what? He's a father who wants to welcome you home lavishly and excessively. Maybe you find yourself in the position of the other son. We don't think of the other son very often, do we? <coughs> Excuse me. This other son who gets a little bit perturbed, right? That would never be anybody in here. I'm talking about other folks, I'm sure. Um, but, but maybe there are some who have looked at other people, you know, you've, you've sat in church or sat somewhere, and you've looked at you know, other people who have committed certain sins or done certain things, you go, I've never done that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's never been, I've never done that. Maybe you're a little jealous because you didn't do that, I don't know. Um, but spiritually speaking, okay, physical distance does not indicate how far away from home you are. Think about that for a second. Okay? It, it's a matter of the, of the heart. And when you think about it that way, this son, the older son, who stays at home is actually farther from home than the boy who left and squandered his father's money. Am I right? You, you can see it in his speech. You can see it in the way that he acts. He's very, very far from home. And you know what? Churches are full of these kinds of people. Got quiet there for a second. Maybe today this one's not full of those kind of people. But in general, people who sit in chairs, sit in pews, and, and do all the right things, raise their hands and do all that right stuff, but 
but their hearts are disconnected from the Father. They're far from home. All of us, every one of us, have ventured from home in one way or another. Maybe you're here today and your relationship with God is not what it should be. Maybe uh, you've gone far from, maybe you've gone as far from Him as you possibly have. You have gone to the other side of the world, basically, as compared to where God is. Maybe you believe in stuff that's so far out there, you think, man, God could never have me back. Maybe your life as a whole is that way. Or maybe it's just a specific area of your life. Hear me today. Father God is calling you home. Amen. Amen. And if you'll turn and come home, he wants to roll out the excess. Amen. Or, or maybe you're like that person I was just talking about. Maybe you've been in church your whole life. And you've sat and you've done the right thing. Been part of the worship team. You've taken the offering. Been on all, all the stuff you're supposed to have been on. And, and every time someone gets saved and they bring them up to the front and they have to take their testimony and everyone claps and it's all great because this great sinner who, who was doing all terrible stuff has now come to the Lord. You're sitting there going, I've never done that terrible stuff. No one's ever brought me up that you testify. <laughs> you know what? God's calling you home as well. In your, in your heart. Father God wants to roll out the excess for those of us who make the journey home. So for the, for the next few minutes, here's what I want to do. I want to look at this father in the story. And I want to look at some of the things he does and some of the things he doesn't do. And we're going to see in that how God's character kind of matches this guy's character. How God wants to roll out the excess, the extravagance on, on us. First, let's start off with a couple things this, guy, that this father does not do. Here's the first thing. He doesn't go track him down. Did you, did you notice that? He doesn't go after this son. doesn't try to go find this son. It's not until the son hits rock bottom and comes to his senses in verse 17 that anything starts to happen. And let me read that again. I'll read verse 17 through 19 real quick. It says, but when he came to himself, or some translations say came to his senses, he, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise, go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. The Bible would call that repentance. You've just seen a picture of repentance. This boy's heart has changed right there in two or three short little verses. He's no longer making excuses. He's no longer trying to defend himself. He simply comes to his senses and his heart changes and he repents. Um, you know what? Some of you here in the room today, you just need to come to your senses. Okay? You just need to, you just need to come to and shake it off and go, my gosh, I've made a mess of my life. My, 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 my marriage is a mess. My finances are a mess. I'm addicted to drugs or alcohol or whatever it might be. My family relationships are a mess. Everything's a mess. You need to come to your senses. You've made it into a mess. You are doing the equivalent of rolling around with the pigs. Thinking it'll be fine. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. But you just need to come to your senses. And when you come to your senses and repent, stop making excuses. That's when all of a sudden the father becomes the prodigal. As you repent, the father starts to come running after him. And you might think, well, why wouldn't the father go and try to save him from all that heartache? You know what? There's just something about repentance. If you don't understand repentance, repentance, repentance is really, you know, probably one of the, the top two or three topics in the Bible. I mean, the whole thing, from cover to cover, is about repentance. When you repent, it just locks something in. And now God throws caution to the wind, stops doing whatever it is he's doing, and starts to come after you. The scripture says the father saw him when he was far off. Think about that for a minute. Ever been a far off? I was in that plane Friday night, 10 o'clock. It was two and a half hours late then. We didn't actually get off the ground until about 12.30. Um, but I remember sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, far, I'm so far from home. <laughs> it, was, it was like midnight, and I'm thinking, 36 hours until I have to preach. Oh my gosh, I am, I am a long way from home. I was a far off. 
You know what? Sometimes when we come to our senses, we'll be a, we'll be a far off. We'll be a long way away. But God sees us when we are afar off. And then verse 20 says, he fell on his neck. I don't know if you notice that. Every time I read that, I go, what is that? Maybe Luke meant to say he grabbed him by his neck. That would be probably a hell of a um, He fell on his neck. But well, we lose a little bit in the translation here. Um, for those of you that, that aren't Bible scholars, like me, um, <laughs> the, the, the New Testament, that was a joke, by the way. I'm not a Bible scholar. Um, I play one on TV. Uh, the... Um, the original New Testament was written in Greek. And so if you want to, to know really the intent of the author, you go back to the Greek. And, um, and here, the Greek word for fell is the Greek word epipito, which means to embrace. And the word neck is the Greek word trachelos, which literally means the throat. But it had more of a, of a figurative meaning. It was actually a phrase that had more of a figurative meaning than a, than a literal meaning. Meaning, And what was happening here was this father was embracing this young boy's life. Okay? The, 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 that word for, for trachelos, trachea is where we get the, our word from. It literally is like the air that this boy was breathing. The, the father was grabbing him by the life. And, and, and grabbing him by his very essence so that he couldn't go. He couldn't leave again. He was embracing him in his current condition and making it so, you know what, I'm not going to let you go again. But that might sound harsh, but he grabbed him by the throat. But you know what? Sometimes some of us need that, don't we? We need to be grabbed by that stiff-necked, rebellious Amen. throat of ours. Amen. Here, here's what else I think is cool. Um, this father doesn't have any kind of conversation with this boy. They don't talk about Anything that's gone on. There's been a bunch of, bunch of crime that's happened. It, it had to be painful for father and brother alike, but yet they don't have any kind of conversation about it. The father doesn't try to expose his political views. Doesn't try to debate any issues with him. Doesn't try to expose any of his false thinking. He just is excited that he's home. And you know what? God's the same way with us. I'm going to tell you something. This may hurt some of you, but God's not interested in your political opinion. Um, your politics isn't going to get you to heaven. God's really not interested in your politics. He's not interested in how you feel about a particular issue. The father here doesn't care if his, his son picked up some different way of looking at the world. Doesn't concern himself with whatever social causes this, this son may have gotten himself involved in. The father is only in the business of welcoming him home with extravagance. And you know what? I think we need to understand this about the character of God. Because I think the church sometimes doesn't get this. Because you know what? There are people around our church, in our community, in our city, who they, they, they don't come home. They don't repent because many of them feel like their political views might disqualify them from our little club. Father God just wants us to come home. Amen. He wants to welcome us home so he can start rolling out the excess. He's not concerned about our, someone's view on immigration or one of the other issues. I will not mention them right now. <laughs> He just wants us to come home. See, it's us that get concerned with all of those other issues. But you know what? And I'm sure I'm going to get somebody mad when I say this, but I think the church got just a little bit too involved in politics for its own good. Amen. Some of you are mad at me. My wife, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not to say, listen, we need to take a stand for what's right. I'm not saying we shouldn't stand for what's right. I'm not saying we shouldn't stand for what we believe in. That's not what I'm talking about. But I believe sometimes our political zeal hinders our spiritual effectiveness when it comes to accomplishing the Great Commission. Jesus, when he was leaving the earth, didn't say, go and make Democrats. <laughs> he didn't say, go and make Republicans. What did he say? Go and make disciples. Now, in the discipleship process, obviously, faulty thinking has to be changed. But that has nothing to do 
with the act of coming home. The example here of God's character is that he's not interested in whatever your political thoughts are. He's not interested in how you feel about a particular issue. He's interested in one thing, welcoming this boy home lavishly and excessively. I want you to get that today. I want you to understand it. So those are some things he didn't do. But let's look at some things that he does. He gives this boy some things. The first thing the father gives him is a robe. He says, get the best robe and put it on him. I think that's verse 22. Yeah, verse 22. What's the reason for the robe? Well, it's to cover him. This kid just came out of the pig pen, right? Probably still wearing his pig farmer clothes. Probably smelling a little right. And so the father puts this robe on him to cover up all of that stench and all of that smell and all of that, that terrible, terrible stuff. For us, how does God the Father cover us? He covers us, of course, with, with Christ Jesus. He covers all of the mess, all of the smell, all of the stuff we've gotten ourselves into. All of that is covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Jesus went to the cross so that we could have access to the Father. And it is that, that, that sacrifice on the cross that covers our sin, that covers the bad stuff that we've done. And, and then he gives him a ring. This, this, this ring is cool. It, it signifies authority, okay? Authority. Um, it signifies value and rank. This father is restoring this son to his rightful place. Um, it, it's, a, it's a symbol of household authority. Now, one of the commentaries I read, I just thought this was so cool. Um, said that this ring gave the son authority to conduct business in the father on the father's behalf. Now think about that for a second. After everything the son had done, the father restores the very thing that the son had failed in, finances, and, and gave him authority to conduct business on his behalf. Wow. Listen, whatever area of life that you totally messed up, Whatever area of life that you totally failed in, God wants to give that, wants to redeem it, give it back to you as a ring, and, and have you conduct business for him on his behalf. Oh my gosh! I think of the things in my, my life, the things I'm embarrassed about, the things that I'm disgusted about. You know what, now as a, as a minister, I wear those things as a ring. I get to conduct business on God's behalf. Amen. That's awesome stuff. And then he puts sandals on his feet. I love this. Servants in a house in this time didn't wear sandals, didn't wear shoes. So they were barefoot. Only members of the family wore shoes, wore sandals. So the fact that the father puts sandals on this kid's feet is further representation that he's being reinstated as a son. This boy is not hired help. He's not a servant. He's a son. I think sometimes as Christians, we have a, a higher hand mentality rather than the mentality of a son or daughter. We have a great teaching called Sons and Servants that Tori and I do. And basically, God wants us to function as sons and daughters, not as, not as slaves, not as servants. Not to just come and do our stuff, you know, do our thing, you know, and, and then go and done, we've done our work. No, we're sons and daughters of the Most High. And if we can get that concept, you know, that, that puts a whole different spin on the, on the tasks that we do. Because we do them as sons and daughters of, of Christ. Sons and daughters <coughs> of the King. Amen? Amen? God's character just amazes me. Because it's so, it's so totally different than my character. <laughs> are, you, are you with me? I am so not like his father. Maybe ultimately I would, I would be, but man, if, my son, if I gave my son money, because my son's not here today, so I can talk about it. If I gave him, he's in, he's in, he's in California, imagine about wasting my inheritance. <laughs> if I were to give my son a bunch of money and they were to go... Spend it on harlots and whatever. First of all, his mom would come after him. Second of all, God's character is not like our character. God's thoughts 
are not our thoughts. God's reactions are different than our reactions. And that doesn't mean there's not consequences for what you do. This kid had to pay consequences. He ended up in a pig pen, shoveling slop and hungry. There were consequences to pay. All that money was gone. He wasn't getting it back. But the father welcomes him back into the family with extravagance, with, with, with a lavishness and, a, and almost a wastefulness. And you know, that's what Father God wants to do for you. I, I don't know, I'm going to wrap this up. I don't, I don't know where you are, or what area of your life that you're far from home in. But whatever area it is, your Heavenly Father wants to roll out the excess as you come to your senses and repent. Amen. So if you're here today and, and you are very far from God, you know what, hear me. When you come to your senses and you wake up, and you go, what? Whatever it is I've been believing, some new age crap. I said crap from the whole thing. <laughs> you know what, i got to shake it off and repent. Amen. Start following God. It, it, if I've been living out of my lustful whatevers, you know what? i got to shake it off and realize I'm, I'm, I'm messing my life up. If you're drinking your life away or, 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 or you're a drug addict, you know what? You just got to come to your senses. God, i got to get home. Amen. i got to get home. So the, the best way for me to, to um, really kind of relate this it is through communion. Because the way home is through Jesus. Amen. Right? Remember I said he's the one that covers us. And when you repent... And you recognize the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. That's the beginning of the journey home. When, when you realize that Jesus is who he said he is. And, and you begin to follow him. We said, I said this last week as the disciples. When he would, when he would say follow me. You know, he would question them. He didn't even you know, do the. Okay you want to follow me. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Repeat this prayer. He didn't say that. He just said follow me. The, the assumption was okay. While you're following me, all these other things will start to take care of themselves. You'll start to learn. When, when, when you come to your senses and you realize that you need to get home, you know what? All that other stuff, it'll all take care of itself. You, you, don't, you don't have to, well, I, you know, my opinion about this is, is so far from, from what I think these people believe or what I've heard Christians believe. I can't, I, I, I can't do that. You know what? That's a lie from the end. Mm -hmm. Begin to follow God. Yeah. Begin to, to get yourself in God's word. Begin to follow Jesus. Okay. And watch the Father roll out the excess. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask um, Luke and John if they would pass out the, uh, the communion elements. And we're going to take communion today. And I would encourage you through this act of communion... I don't intend this to be a religious act or just a tradition that we do just because we do it. The Assemblies of God says I'm supposed to do this on the first Sunday of the month, and so usually I'm rebellious and I try to do it on the last Sunday of the month. Yeah. Just to be rebellious. Just to be rebellious. Um, but it's not just a, a tradition. There's, there's life in the understanding of what we're doing. There's, there's life in what these things represent. Thank you, Jesus. Worship team, once you get your communion elements, why don't you go ahead and make your way back up to the platform. Thank you. Father, I thank you that your word is true. I thank you, Lord, that even in my weakness, you're strong. It's been a struggle for me just to get the words out today. I'm going to be honest with you. Just struggling with my head being stuffy. But you know what? It's not about how eloquent or how good I speak it. It's about the revelation. It's about the, the truth of God's word. It's about the truth of what the Father, what his character is like. Father, I pray that your character would shine through today. I pray, Lord, that your character would shine past my weakness, Lord, physically. And I pray, Father, that those that are far from home would come to their senses today and make that journey. Once you have your communion element, just hold on to it. We invite everyone, if you're a follower of Jesus, to participate in communion with us. 
You don't have to be a member of this church. As long as you are a follower of Jesus, we want you to participate with us. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this is a great time to become one. One, because it, there's eternal life in it. Two, then you can participate with us. <laughs> First Corinthians, chapter 11. The Apostle Paul writes, The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the, the communion bread. Lord, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you, Lord, that you went to the cross for us. We thank you for what that means in our life. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, I pray that the reality of it would shake us at our foundation today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Before we take and eat, if you're one of those that finds yourself far from home, spiritually speaking, if you're not a follower of Jesus, as of right now, and you're struggling with, should I follow, should I not? You know what? Last week I read, I read a story about how he called the disciples, and man, they left everything, and they, and they went. If you're ready today to begin that journey, I'd be remiss if I didn't just give you an opportunity to say, yes, that's me. I need to, I need to begin to follow Jesus. So before we, we take it, I'm not going to have you do anything crazy. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just raise your hand and say, I need to start following Jesus today. I need to make that decision. Just lift your hand up and just let me see. If there's nobody, that's cool. But if there's anybody, I just want to give you that opportunity. Lord, we thank you for your broken body as we partake it today. I pray that those who are far from home, in whatever area of their life, would begin that journey. Thank you, Lord, for your broken body. Let's take it today. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup, bow your head. Lord, we thank you for your broken body and your spilled blood. We know that there's power in your blood. We know that there's healing, freedom in your blood. As we partake of this cup today, I pray, Lord, that whatever's needed here, Lord, that you would provide deliverance, Lord. Those need to be delivered. You know what? If you're struggling with besetting sin, maybe it's whatever it is. Drug addiction, lust, anger, whatever it might be. As we, as we partake of this blood, this, this cup that signifies his blood today, allow the Lord to deliver you. 